live now. Um, we're, we're having um, a live show on here in Project Nerdy to celebrate um, Halloween since, uh, for a variety of reasons, several of us weren't able to do our video this past couple of weeks for our Halloween cosplay theme. So um, we're joining you here on Halloween night. So actually, I, I'm awful at time zones. Is it actually still Halloween in Japan, or is it the day before, or the day after? Or? It's uh, it's 10:50 on the morning of All Hallows Day, first of November. So Reb's a time traveler. Yeah. Nori in the future. The future, future is bright. <laughs> so he already knows how Halloween's going to go and everything. And so. Uh, so is Halloween a real big deal in Japan at all, or? Actually, here it is. It is quite big. Yeah. Um, there are decorations in a lot of the shops. You can buy costumes from so many different places, and the the people here kind of go a little crazy for for giving stuff away. So um, I've had people stop me in the street. Uh, and say trick or treat. Wow! As I was walking around, yeah, lots and lots of people last night were were dressed in costumes, so it's quite cool here, actually. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a reference to Halloween, you know, in the Asian regions. I wasn't sure if it was big in that part of the world as well. I mean, at this point, I think with globalization, I think almost all holidays tend to go worldwide at this point. But yeah. I think one of the things, though, is that Japan loves America. Yeah. Like, the people of Japan are, are such big fans of, like, almost anything American. Um, that, yeah, Halloween came here and Christmas came here basically when the, the influences of American culture started to come into Japanese culture, so... And obviously, Japan does everything bigger and, and oh yeah, <laughs> more exciting than a lot of people. Yeah, I can only imagine what their um, costumes look like. Yeah, I mean, some of them are not so different. But um, one of the th one of the things I noticed is that the the sexy costumes were in the same place, the same aisle of the store as the as the like regular costume. Oh, are they? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was I was browsing through, sort of general. You know, you could dress as Mickey Mouse, or you could dress as, or sexy uh, pumpkin, or something like that. And then right next to it was like the, the mini 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 skirt version, of like a maid or something like that, just right in the same aisle, the kind of thing that you'd see in, um, huh, I don't know the, the equivalent in the States, but we have Ann Summers here in the UK, I say here, in the UK we have a store called Ann Summers, which is like a, like a shop where you can go to, to buy something nice for your girlfriend, or your girlfriend can buy something nice for you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I like a, I would say probably a department store maybe. Store. Mm. So yeah, in <clears throat> in Tokyo at least we have a, a mega store called Don Quixote, which is it's like the kind of place where you can go to buy almost anything. Yeah. And um yeah, that's where that's where a lot of the costumes that I found were, and there were some yeah there were some interesting ones. <laughs> um, so but most yeah mostly normal the stuff that you'd find in yours. Cool. Uh, so why don't we uh, maybe touch on some maybe our uh, favorite parts of Halloween either. Currently, or when we were kids. So, um, David, why don't you uh, um, start that conversation off? Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, as you guys may remember from last year, Halloween is a big deal at our house. Very big deal. Um, I'm Charlie Brown today, by the way. I don't know if you can see my curl on my head. Yep. And my uh, 
my T-shirt, which, uh, ironically, okay, here's the thing about that. Lib, sidetrack for two seconds. <laughs> this is the first T-shirt I've painted in a long time, and, like, paint causes a shirt to not stretch. So I went to Ooh. put the shirt on this morning, and it was like... Oh, wow. Well, I never really was, thought of that. Anyways, um, and then, hold on, because you got to see the back. Can you see the back of my head there? Yep. Because, of course, Charlie Brown was the perfect model. Yeah. Um, anyway, and I have a bed sheet that I um, cut a bunch of holes out of because that's how he went um, for Halloween, which somebody said today at work that was costumeception, like Inception, but for costumes because I was <laughs> Charlie Brown as a ghost on Halloween. Um, anyway, all that to say, uh, Halloween is a big deal at our house. Um, we've been watching, I mean... My dad loves Halloween. My parents both love the fall. They met in the fall. And um, we've, I mean, we've been carving pumpkins since I was a kid. There's, like, rules. There's, uh, <laughs> I, you think I'm kidding. There are rules. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a big deal. And so, I don't know. I, I really love um, just spending that time with my family, The all of the traditions that we have of going to the pumpkin patch and seeing, um, looking back at pictures and seeing how our carving skills have improved or sometimes not improved over the years um, and remembering the pumpkins that were great and the ideas that didn't turn out so great because there's always that one, you're like, oh, this is going to be the coolest pumpkin ever, and then it completely just, like, tanks. Um, <laughs> so I like that. I like the, um, gosh... I don't know. I like it all. I like the... I really like... Okay, can we talk about for two seconds? Can we geek out for two seconds about Disney Channel original Halloween movies? Because they are the best. Like, yeah, I understand I, people like scary movies, and that's fine, and I really don't care about that. But, like, Twitches, Twitches 2, Halloween <laughs> Town... Yeah, I, like, never, I never saw any of that, because didn't, we didn't have cable as a... I didn't get cable until I was in high school. So, like, all those shows of people in my generation that watch either on Disney or Nickelodeon, I never saw any of those. So I completely I was, missed it. This yeah. is how it happened. I went to college. I was a freshman in college, and I had cable, finally, yeah. for the first time in years. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I was watching cable all the time because it was so new and the cool thing. Yeah. And then Halloween week, Disney starts playing all of these old Disney Channel original movies that are all... Halloween based and it was like I had discovered the whole thing. It's they're all good and they're cheesy of course because they're decoms, but they're so good. Now, on TV I will say I always enjoyed uh, like the Halloween episodes of some of my favorite TV shows. I mean some of my favorite episodes of like Buffy or their Halloween episodes and even just random sitcoms where they have a Halloween because it gives them a chance to do something different and a lot of times they can ignore the storyline for one episode and they can just do something randomly they wouldn't do on on a specific episode. Yeah, um, yeah. I was actually bummed out because I like the Big Bang Theory a lot and this week they didn't do a Halloween episode which kind of threw me off because they've always done really big Halloween episodes. It's like, what? You know, where, where's the Halloween episode they always do? And... Mm. Huh. So yeah, Treehouse of Horror is kind of one of my favorite things. Oh yeah, it's the same with me. Those you know. lines. So like when when the Simpsons do the the Treehouse of Horror episodes. I was gonna because, say that's the Simpsons, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're awesome. Yeah. Because it's like it's like they have their own continuity line. It's like you know, yeah. some of the things that have happened in Treehouse of Horror will like affect further Treehouse of Horror episodes. You'll see little references popping up in them. Yeah, it's um, uh, I guess one of the nerdy things I do. I have a lot of the Simpsons seasons on DVD and I watch all the commentaries and the writers hate the Halloween episodes. They say they're like the hardest to write. Uh, <laughs> is that the expectations are so high for a lot of people that oh, yeah. yeah. you know, supposed to be the best episode of the entire year. And a lot of the obvious Halloween stuff they've already done. So it's like every year they have to come up with new stuff and it's like every year it has to become more and more extreme and they said it's a it's a nightmare to try to come up with stuff that's really gonna meet people's level of expectation for that. Yeah. And then they struggle because some years they'll come back and they'll do something and then Fox will come back and say, no, it's too gory or something. And 
you know, <laughs> completely redo something for it. And oh, I got a lot of fucks. And like, one that... of my favorite ones when Homo sold his soul for a donut, and ended up oh, cursed yeah. to have a donut. <laughs> And I remember one thing when I was watching, kind of, which is a good point when they talk about that one. You know, basically for that episode, they do three stories, but each story only has like five minutes. So imagine to try to basically do what would normally be an entire episode, they have to do an entire story plot in like three to five minutes with jokes. Yeah. So it's, I mean, they, they they hate it, but it's still, I mean, it's awesome, awesome every year in my opinion. Hmm. Um, I guess I'll um. Touch on some of my childhood stuff for Halloween. Do it. For an adult. Uh, so when I, I grew up in the country, I mean, I grew up on a farm. Um, so trick or treating was very different for me compared to somebody that might live in like a, a city or a subdivision or apartment complex. So, you know, we couldn't walk to trick or treat. We had to drive house to house because every house is three or four miles apart. Um, so there was a little mm. circle we did. So when I was a little kid, we'd do that. My mom would drive us. You know, we'd hit. I, most people that live near me are my relatives, cousins, and stuff like that. So you'd go to my aunts and uncles, cousins, and trick or treat. But it wasn't a whole, whole lot of houses. Um, but I want to say when I was eight or nine, the local church in area started doing a um, a hay bale ride, where basically they would do a tractor with a you know a big trailer full of hay, and then they would just, there was a kind of a circle, a loop they can make, and basically all the kids' community would ride with a tractor, and then you could basically do a community-wide trick-or-treat. So air, basically all the kids would come to a house at once. So it kind of <laughs> turned into a big community event where you'd be like, you'd hang out with like 30 or 40 kids the entire night and just trick-or-treat with that one big bunch. So it was a lot of fun because wow. it turned into like a big party, you know, while you're making loop. I know my mom said the parents hated it because when you were doing the house and giving out the candy, you wouldn't have any trick-or-treaters the entire night. And then suddenly you have like 40 kids at your door for like two minutes. It was like yeah. a, a rush, and then it was over, and they didn't get any other trick or treaters the rest of the night. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I always enjoyed that. And then the elementary school I went to always had a big um, Halloween festival that was kind of like a fall festival style thing where they had like a all the you know typical festival booths. Um, they had like a dunk take where a teacher would get in there and the students would have a chance to dunk the teachers. They'd have a real tame haunted house. They'd do a costume contest, a cakewalk, stuff like that. Um, and the town the elementary school was in was only four or five hundred people. So that was like the biggest event in the town the entire year. So it was, I remember as a kid it was a big deal. Now costume wise, you really couldn't buy a store about costumes that much. You could buy a mask, but you'd have to home make everything else. Um, mm. So, I mean, costumes have changed a lot. I noticed uh, I have to work a Halloween event every year now for the city I work for, and most of the families come and theme costumes. Like, the parents are dressed up, the kids are dressed up. Like, you know, they're mm. all characters from The Wizard of Oz, or they're all Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or that type of stuff. I can't imagine when I was a kid, my mom and dad dressing up when I went trick or treat. That just never entered my mind that was even a possibility, but it's... I count we just have become a bigger and bigger holiday every year in America. It's just exploding, so now, like, you know, now it's weird if you don't dress up for the holiday almost. Oh, great. I like that. I think when I was younger, Halloween was just... I mean, so, in the UK, Halloween's still not a great big thing, and... It's strange because it, it, you know, it has Celtic origins and started yeah. back in our, on our island to begin with. But I think, yeah, America just does things bigger than than the UK ever would. And yeah, it's really exploding. Um, I think I've heard the stat recently. Like now, by like the amount of money that's spent on holidays, it's like Halloween's only the second to Christmas at this point. Because yeah. people spend I wouldn't a ton be surprised. Of, you know, costumes, candy, decorations, and stuff like yeah. that. But it seemed like, I mean, and David probably has uh, seen this too, I would think, because um, I don't think Missouri is probably too different from Georgia. It seemed like it's really exploded in, like, the last 10 years or so, where it even got bigger, where it used to be, like, it would just be with Halloween, and then it slowly is, like, maybe the week of Halloween. Now it's, like, the entire month of October. There's just Halloween-themed stuff going on nonstop. The way Christmas now is, like, two months 
So basically, it's yeah. almost like we skip Thanksgiving now. You just do October as Halloween, and then November and December is Christmas, and it's just you have three months of basically nonstop stuff, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure you want to hear my opinions on Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Christmas here. I love Christmas. The Christmas here is quite funny. I want to talk about Christmas in in Japan because uh, everyone goes to KFC, <laughs> gets a family bucket, and and eats chicken at home. <laughs> that's that's Christmas in Japan. <laughs> fried chicken. It's hard to go wrong with fried chicken. No. Mm, yeah. It's basically no, no, because, I've... like, Christianity just isn't, like, I think about 1% of, of Japanese people are Christians, yeah. and, like, you can't get turkeys in Japan. Like, turkey is, is not, a, not a meat that people eat, so it's kind of, oh, let's, let's do something cool for Christmas, and, and so people went and bought chicken, because it's the closest thing to turkey, and, and they just, they have the family time. But yeah, there's there's nothing nothing Christian about Christmas in, in Japan. Hmm. Speaking of food, that's probably a good segue to Halloween. Um, uh, so, do you have any specific uh, favorite Halloween candy or treats or <laughs> stuff that um, you're a big fan? I know personally, me one thing I know a lot of people hate, but I always liked a lot is I've always loved candy corn, which I don't know if they have candy corn in. England or Japan. Oh, you know what? I tried that once, and it just did not did not appeal to me at all. Most people don't <laughs> like. Most people don't like. I mean, I've always loved it, but. Oh, okay. So, um, like apple bobbing is a thing that I enjoy. You know, when you get a big bucket yeah. and there's like apples floating around in the water, that's quite fun. Yeah, the, actually, the festival I work at every year for Halloween, um, they no longer do apple bob bobbing because they consider it unsanitary to have all the kids go in the same bucket of water. Yeah. So the, the alternative that comes up with, they still do it, but what they do is they hang apples from a string from a tent, and the kids have to try to bite the apple on the string, which is really hard because every time their face touches it, the apple will move around and stuff. And if they're oh, able yeah. to bite and lock onto the apple... Then that they get to take the apple down and keep it, and they give them like caramel and stuff, and they cut it up so they have a little tasty treat. So they basically oh. are doing apple bobbing without the water and air. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, you said apple bobbing, and with your dialect there, Reb, it sounded like apple bobby, and so <laughs> some like British candy, not like weird British candy because it's not, we just don't have it but I'm picturing like some chewy mix between like caramel with apple chunks in it and like break your jaw trying to chew this thing like toffee, I'm, I don't even know I'm thinking, so, and then you said uh, it was a bobbing for apples and I was like oh, obviously um, <laughs> that's not... you, need, you need to make this sweet that you've just invented it will uh, it will revolutionize Halloween. Here, here first, folks. <laughs> Apple Bobby. <laughs> I will tell you though, um, Eminem. Uh, what was that? It's been three or four years now. They've been making uh, during Halloween white chocolate M and M's with candy corn centers in them. I've never had. Wow. I've never they heard of those. Amazing. They. I oh, I limit myself to one bag because otherwise I would weigh four hundred pounds. But uh, they're yeah, I've never, I've never even heard of those. So, oh, it sounds that's... like the kind of thing you could only eat one bag of before, like you see the rest of your meals for the day. <laughs> yeah, kind of have to. I can't, I can't imagine that much sugar in one place. Like candy corn is the sweetest thing that I've ever put in my mouth, and then wrap it in white chocolate. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like candy corn. Even though I like candy corn, you can't eat many pieces of it. I mean, after a handful, you start feeling nauseous or something because it is so sweet. I mean, it's, it's you basically feel, you feel yourself getting cavities as you're eating it. Basically, <laughs> I mean, it is. It's, it's like a bunch of grumpy old men talking about how bad it is that these things are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> 
I do like um, we make a Chex Mix that's got like a peanut butter caramel thing to it and it has candy corn in it and that stuff is good. And that's nice because you've got like the crunchy of the Chex and there's peanuts in it so it's kind of salty but then you've got a piece or two of candy corn in there so it's the most yeah, desirable I, portion of all of the realities as the Cyrus Child would say. Yeah, I, I've, I've had like trail mix like that with candy corns in it and it is it, it kind of lessens the sugary impact of the candy corn. It sounds quite good, actually. It sounds quite good. Oh. So I I wasn't sure whether I would have trick or treaters because where where I live is like a like a dormitory. So there's there's loads of different people from different walks of life all living in this one building, and I wasn't sure if some of them would maybe knock on my door or ring my buzzer. So I made sure that I had something, and I just I just bought like a pack of choco pies. With a like a Halloween theme on the packet, <laughs> so I had something to give to people if they came trick or treating. And did you have any trick or treaters? No one came, so now I have to eat a whole pack of chocolate pies. Darn! <laughs> Woe is me. Yeah, that's what I. Since I have to work on Halloween night, when I get home, usually trick or treaters are already ended, so I might get a couple random ones. So I, I have to get a bag of candy just for the couple random ones. But I know I. I not enough for come for me to get rid of the entire bag. So I always make sure I buy something that I like, so I it's something I can eat. Um, yeah. that, the first year I was in my house, I made the mistake of just buying some random Halloween candy and half the stuff was stuff I hated. So then I was just <laughs> stuck with stuff that I didn't want to mess with. Um, but this year I bought like the variety pack of like uh, Butterfingers and uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups and that type of stuff. Mm. Uh, <laughs> which I've never had. I got the the Butterfinger version of, of peanut butter cups. So it's like a combination yeah. of the two candy bars, which is amazing. I think I tried one of those, and it was too much chocolate for me. Yeah, it does have a little bit. I don't think I like it as much as the standard one, but it's still, you know, for like a, a one-time-a-year treat, it's pretty good. Hmm. So, Reb, are you supposed to... I mean, you've got this wolf thing going on there. It's like... Yeah, I mean, I do... You know what, like, so I, I didn't have a, a denim shirt or denim jacket, and I've shopped around for one, but it's just not something that you can buy or should really actually be able to buy because really denim... No. Um, but, so the, the aim of this... And I had some sunglasses. I was going to say, wolf. Yeah, it was to go... Go for like, the the Michael J. Fox Teen Wolf. Yeah, once you said denim jacket, oh, that has to be Teen Wolf. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just absolutely could not find a denim jacket, and the closest thing I have is like a, like a black zip-up hoodie, and it's just not the same. So I'm just. There, I mean, there's a there's a couple scenes where he just wears a shirt, so this is still technically quite accurate. <laughs> Yeah, I always have to get uh, some sort of kid-friendly costume because the, the event I work is really like a kid-friendly trick-or-treat event every year, so I always have to wear a costume at that. So it has to be something that doesn't freak the kids out, but something they also get. Um, yeah. And the reason I redid Waldo this year is last year when I read is the, the most positive response I'd ever got from kids. Like they came up and would say, oh, I read, I've read your book. You know, they actually thought I was Waldo. So, like, oh, that's awesome. I have to do this again. But, I mean, it's weird stuff because, you know, you've seen that little Afro wig I have, like, with sunglasses. That I only wore that one year. That scared kids. They didn't like that. They said it covered too wow. much and stuff. So, it took me a while to find one that really kids, you know, accepted. But they like Waldo. Yeah. Which is good, which means they're reading yeah. books. So, I'm all for that. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm, I'm I'm loving Charlie Brown. I wasn't sure what it was to begin with because Charlie Brown wasn't really a big thing for me when I was growing up, but <clears throat> I can see it now. I I tell you what, I abs I pretty much have uh, it's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown memorized at this point. Um, I feel like it's one of those things where, and someday we got to do this, where if you were to give me like the video track. 
and then as a puzzle give me all of like the lines and the sound clips and all of the music and like sound yeah. effects and stuff, I could probably put it all together where it's supposed to go because I've just seen it so many <laughs> times. And oh, I, I, mean, uh, I was going to say, the, I mean, I watch, I, the Halloween special, I don't always try to watch it every year. I'll catch it, but like the Charlie Bone, I mean, my big thing with Charlie Brown is like, you know, the Christmas specials, it might be my favorite Christmas special. I mean, I, I have to see that every Christmas. I mean, it's amazing. Right. And I, I think that's funny because I didn't really see the Christmas special until I was like a teenager. Yeah. But we watched the Halloween special like religiously. It's like, I mean, of course, Halloween's big in our house. So. Yeah. I think is I, I got older and was like, oh, there's a Christmas special, and people are like, yeah, that's the only one we ever watched, and I was like, but it's the Great Pumpkin is the best thing ever. Like, that's yeah, really good. Um, and so, and it was kind of ironic, obnoxious. I'm not sure. Um, we had a a week at work here about oh two three weeks ago that was basically a Spirit Week for adults, and on like. Come as your. It, there was one day that was like your movie star day or whatever. So I went as Linus, and I had um, a red uh, striped shirt, and I like used um, an eyeliner out of my theater makeup kit to draw his hair on my bald head, yeah. and nobody got it. I even took a blue blanket that I borrowed from my nephew, and nobody got it. But then I walk in today, and it's like everyone's like, "Oh, you're Charlie Brown. What's up, Chuck?" Like, and everybody. So it was like, I was like. Come on, people. <laughs> but you can't get Linus? Like, what is that? What's the world coming to? <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about costuming in general in Japan. Yeah. So if you look at my screen share, this is like the, the Halloween decorations in the store where I was shopping for costumes. They're quite cool. And the masks here are just... Amazing. So that's just that's just a Batman mask that you can just buy on a shelf, in a in a normal. Like so, this is this is what I was saying with Don Quixote, and then these this is cosplay, like store bought cosplay. Wow. So all of these are characters from from different anime, and I don't know how big Vocaloid has gotten in the states, but. Yeah, Vocaloid is like one of the biggest exports from Japan. <clears throat> um, as as horror goes, this is from a, a TV show called um, Madoka Magica, um, and it's it's you know like Sailor Moon is magical girl anime, like the the girl transform. Yeah. This takes that genre and it makes it like horrific and twisted and these costumes are so exactly perfect I was just I was shocked but in a good way and then so these are these are costumes you can buy in Don Quixote so you have uh, obviously Goku and Vegeta from Dragon Ball but then you can be like the Dragon Ball bad guys as well so there's Frieza down at the bottom and Piccolo Cool. And of course a one piece costume. But yeah, this one this is just in a um like a, a tourist kind of souvenir shop. So they they sell costumes like everywhere. And I just found this one so cute. This is a kid's costume and it's red white red riding wool hood. So it's like like Red Riding Hood caught the werewolf gene. <laughs> and then the Pokemon store, because Pokemon store. It's oh. vaguely related to cosplay, so... Yeah. And then this. This was just, this was just like, a, like the equivalent of HMV, like a Tower Records kind of thing. Just in the window, they have the costumes from a concert that some J-pop boy band wore. And then Halloween postcard. So yeah, Halloween's pretty big in Japan. That's awesome. So on uh, 
I know you mentioned that you was wondering if kids would come to your door or trick or treating. I mean, trick or, that part of Halloween's big in Japan too. People go trick or treating and stuff. Oh yeah. Um. So, like, <clears throat> I've seen groups of maybe four or five high school kids all dressed up and they were walking up and down streets. So it's not even just limited to the small children. But <clears throat> I saw a couple of parents with their kids walking up uh, the street kind of opposite where I live um, and they were all dressed in costume. So it's, it's big enough that I saw it happen. And I live in kind of a a sort of suburban part of Tokyo, so I don't know what it'd be like in the in the more built up areas. But the thing about Tokyo, like compared to any other major city that I've ever been to, it's like the safest place. So amazing. Like I've been coming home from a night out at like midnight, one AM and I've seen women just going for a late night run. Like at midnight on their own. And like, I know friends who've left their wallet on a table in a cafe and come back and it's still there. Like, after going to the bathroom for five minutes or something. That's so awesome. going trick-or-treating isn't, yeah, isn't a worry for anyone. Hmm. Like, they won't get hurt. But then, I think that's why in the UK trick-or-treating isn't really a thing, because... Parents are worried about their kids going out at night, and people in their homes are worried about strangers knocking on their doors. So it kind of died out completely in the UK. Yeah, here I think, um, I mean, I'm not sure if it's the same way in Missouri, but like in Georgia, it seems like a lot of, they're moving towards, instead of doing, and like you still have some neighborhood trick-or-treating and stuff, but there's a lot of, where you'll have more like centralized events, where like there's almost like a, uh, a lot of, Groups will do like trunk or treats now, where um, I know a lot of churches do that, where all the church members will bring their car to the church parking lot, and basically the kids trick or treat car to car, and you have the candy in the back of your car, so that way, um, that like so the city I work for, they do a huge festival in our park uh, that has games and activities, but it's mainly for kids to trick or treat, and I would say two or three thousand kids come to that, because um, I think mainly, at least in the area I live. What people are most worried about safety-wise is not dealing with strangers and stuff like that. It's having kids running around on streets when it's dark and they're more afraid mm -hmm. like a car might hit them or something. Because um, I know actually when I was coming home and driving through my subdivision, I mean, I was going just like four or five miles per hour and I still felt like, oh, this is not safe because there were just kids running all over the place. Um, so I think people start almost moving towards stuff like that to kind of make it a little bit more pedestrian safety for the kids so you don't have to worry about them like running in front of a car or something like that. But I know at least I haven't in a long time heard any warnings about like, oh, somebody gave out, you know, apples with razor blades in it or anything like that, you know, <laughs> like the little wives tales about like Halloween and stuff like that. Um, right. Well, and now, I mean, we have similar stuff here in the Midwest. Um, our mall has a night, and I don't know if it's on, I think they do on Halloween, have you can trick-or-treat store-to-store. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a little safer. Um, a lot of, there again, a lot of churches are doing trunk-or-treat. Um, where they, you know, in, here in the Midwest, they even, like, will pop their trunk and have the candy in the back and decorate the trunk as well. Yeah, I've heard oh. of someone doing that. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um and we, we have had some neighborhood, I think we had, uh, Dad said we had like 27 trick-or-treaters tonight. Um, so we, we do have a little bit of neighborhood stuff, but I think just in general with Halloween becoming so much of a bigger uh, holiday and especially with, you know, cosplay being more of a deal and we've got more events for adults where it's okay to dress up and we dress up at work, like, I think... Um, in general, we're just becoming more, I don't know, a lot of those stigmas of, um, I don't know, I, I guess we just, we police things better. I know yeah. too, um, places where you can, like, literally go take your bag of candy and they'll run it through a scanner and look for, you know, see if anything's up, you know, or whatever. Um, so... 
I don't know. And personally, I like that we can dress up as adults because who doesn't yeah. like to do that? Like, it's cool. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I was thought was really neat. There's a store right near where I work. It's like a clothing boutique, and there's like eight or ten of them in the state of Georgia. They just started in the last few years. It's a family-run business, um, but they're huge on social media. That's where they do a lot of the promotions. Um, it's all women's fashion stuff. And as part of my job, I have to follow all the businesses' social media pages and stuff like that. But they did something really neat for Halloween every year. That each store comes up with a group costume for all their employees. Then they post all the pictures like on Instagram, and then the fans of the store vote for their favorite group costume, and then that store wins a big prize. So if you're if you're the employees at the store that wins, they get like a huge cash bonus. So like awesome. that, the stores go all out on the costumes. Like this year, like. Um, I don't know who won yet, but like one of the themes was like one store did Shark Week, so every employee wore like a day of the week, but they had like shark bites on the calendar dates, and like one person was dressed up as a shark. <laughs> like you had really creative themes and stuff like that. Like like one it did like Disney fairy princesses, but like with a a twist. I can't remember what the twist was, but they it just wasn't standard costumes. They were going all out. Mm. Um, you know, I kind of agree with David. It's, it's not a big deal now, like if you're grown up and you're dressed up on Halloween, it's like, oh, it's just Halloween. We're like, yeah. when I was a kid, I don't remember seeing any adults really just dressed up unless they were at a Halloween event. I mean, you wouldn't go into a store and see like, oh, the person behind the counter is dressed up in costume, and that just, I don't think would have happened, but now it's more commonplace. Yeah. Yeah, all of the stuff in like any of the stores, like I'm talking just a convenience store, were dressed in costumes last night, like everyone, because like, so costuming is like a really big thing in Japan in general, and you'll see costumes for all sorts of different reasons, but um, yeah, everyone was, everyone was wearing their costumes everywhere last night, so all of the stuff in the store where I bought my candy were all dressed in costume, and it was really great to see that. Um, but yeah, when when I was um, <clears throat> sort of younger and, and we worked, the, this, the Halloween parties that we had were like half and half, where, you know, that you'd have people like me who were enthusiastic about costuming and we'd dress up still, but like some people would say, oh no, I'm too old for that, or yeah, I don't really like dressing up. And I think now... Now, like, you'd have parties where they just wouldn't be let in. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> I mean, so last year, in my job, the, the, group, uh, the group Halloween costume theme was Alice in Wonderland. And I went as the Cheshire Cat. I always seem to have fur in my Halloween costumes. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at this point, like that event I work at, like the the parents who dress up by far outnumber the parents who don't dress up now with their kids. I mean, I would say it was overwhelmingly 70, 80 percent of parents were in costume with their kids as they were taking them trick or treating. And a lot of times, it was a family theme costume and stuff like that, um, which is so cool. It's awesome. There were some, there were some amazing ones. Um, uh, like I said, I saw definitely a. Uh, there was every year. Obviously, a lot of Wizard of Oz, where like maybe the like the mom's Dorothy, the dad's the Ten Men or the Scarecrow, and the kids are the other ones. And a lot of times they'll have a dog with them too, and stuff like that. <laughs> um, I was trying to think of some of the other family theme ones I saw. Um, they, I've seen in Incredibles, a, a family all dressed as the Incredibles. That was really cool. Oh, I saw a, a family that was all. Uh, the the four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles today, <laughs> they are really cool. Um, let's see which other ones was there? Um, I saw online somewhere I forget where, and, but I remember seeing it because I told my brother in law because he also loves Pokemon, um, and it was the the dad was Ash and the mom was dressed as Misty, and then the baby who must have been like one or two because he was standing he was standing on his own but he looked like a toddler and he was Pikachu oh man and it was like perfect <laughs> so I've seen some because I go to quite a few conventions I've seen some family themed cosplays that could maybe work for Halloween 
and um, like one of them, there was the dad was dressed up as like this big kind of robot. And the kid was on his shoulders as like the pilot of the robot. Oh, cool! I can't, I, I'm not sure what show it was from, but it was it was really cool to see. That reminds me of costume I saw at uh, Dragon Con this year. There was a uh, the dad was dressed up as Luke Skywalker training on Dagobah, and his baby was on his back as Yoda. <laughs> you know, the scene that's how Luke's carrying Yoda around is on his back, so it looked identical to that. And he, of course, the baby had the Yoda costume on. It was. Awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah, I figure there's loads of different things that you could do to, to make a family-friendly costume, and I think it's it's really great to have fun with your kids while they're growing up and make costumes that work for everyone to enjoy. Yeah. Wish I had that growing up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I was really... I mean, there were a lot of really creative costumes. Um, you know, you tell people to put a lot of time... I mean, one of the most creative ones, and this one the parents weren't dressed up, with, but they had like a... I want to say it's maybe a baby that was like one year old, but they dressed it up as like a Cabbage Patch doll, but they were rolling her around in like a little cart. So what they did, they made a box that looked like a... the package for a Cabbage Patch doll, and they put the box over her so it looked like a Cabbage Patch doll in the package. <laughs> and it was awesome. I mean, people were just stopping them and asking them to take pictures with it as they were going around trick-or-treating. I mean, but they, you could tell they put a lot of thought into that costume for, you know, a, a one-year-old baby, basically. Excuse me. <sighs> So what time? What what times are we at over over in your ten thirty world East coast? Two thirty a.m. No, ten thirty. Oh, ten. Wow. Yeah, thirty p.m. Yeah. Yeah, it's um yeah it's nine thirty here. Um, I apologize for yawning. It's been a long day. Fridays are my long day, so. I'm still here, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So we've talked about Halloween in general, we've talked about costumes, talked about traditions. I mean there is there is there's gotta be something that you hate about Halloween, right? There's gotta be something that really makes you upset when Halloween comes around. Um, well, I mean, I, although I enjoy working the event, uh, it's a bummer that basically like every year I know I'm working an event Halloween night. Mm. So I, while I'm at the event, I'm having fun, but then I know basically like personal level, like, you know, I really can't go to any Halloween parties and stuff like that, or I can't be home for all the trick-or-treaters. Um, for mm. example, like, yeah, I have a new person who um, works with me in my department now who just started, and she's newly married. Um, her, her and her husband just bought a new house and stuff, and she was kind of bummed out that, you know, it's first year that she has a home that she really wasn't going to be home for the trick-or-treaters. Her husband was, but she was going to miss that. Yeah. Um, so there's some parts, like, the event's awesome to work at, but it's still, you know, like, it'd be cool to be here at the house doing all the trick-or-treaters, or if my friends were having a Halloween party, to go to that. So having a job, yeah. where basically knows as long as I have this job, I'll be working on Halloween you know, that's a little bit of a bummer, but other than that, I mean, there's, I don't have too many complaints about Halloween. For me, the, for some reason I don't understand, the, the stores have Halloween tinsel. So it's, it's like they, they took Christmas and changed the colors and added bats and they think that's a Halloween decoration. Ah. Uh, and it uh, just... I will say, I'll, you might not like to hear this, but I, I, we used Halloween tinsel to decorate our booth at the event I worked at today. <laughs> it's a real easy decoration. You can, throw it on table and you can make a, just a regular white. table on a Halloween table by just taping a little tinsel to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I will say that that does bug me, and um, maybe not about Halloween, but in about um, holidays in general. I know, like, it used to be, I'm going to be no more day. When I was a kid, um, you <laughs> could only get candy corn at Halloween. Like, yeah. candy corn equaled Halloween. And now we have Christmas yeah. Day and Valentine's Day candy corn. And it's like, it's not special. What I like about my holidays is that there's this this candy that I get in Halloween. And then there's this candy that we have for Christmas. And yeah. then you can only get it for that holiday. So Yeah, the best um, example I have of that is... Um, is um, as a kid, I was obsessed with uh, Cadbury eggs, which uh, <laughs> I think now you can get them pretty much all the time. But like when I was a kid, I think you could only buy them around Easter. Yep. Yeah. So my mom knew I loved Cadbury eggs so much, she would buy like 60 of them and just stash them in the fridge. <laughs> like for three or four months, I could have a Cadbury egg when I wanted them. Now, but a tip on Cadbury eggs, they don't preserve very well in the fridge so they buy after a couple months they're no longer quite as good as they were when they were fresh off the shelf but oh yeah yeah I, I mean I remember like you know before you know Netflix and internet, like that's one reason why the Charlie Brown Christmas special and stuff like that or the Halloween special was such a big deal because it was on TV like once a year and that was it yeah now they even show it several times but like you know they'll show it on broadcast TV but then you can watch it 20 times on cable TV, um, so you no longer, like, it, it was like a, it used to be like a, a one-night event, like, oh, if you wanted to see Charlie Brown, you have to be home this night at this time. Now yeah. you have 30 chances to catch it, so it, I get what you're saying, where it kind of loses a little bit of its specialty, because it is so widely available. I think the thing that bugs me the most is our, the overabundance of just very scary stuff. And I, I mean, I understand it's Halloween, like, duh. But I I know I personally really don't care for that. I don't, like, I don't watch scary movies. I don't, I don't do that, the whole demonic, super creepy stuff. And so I kind of wish, you know, because I would like to go to a Halloween store and get a wig or some costume pieces or something but I can't because there's these super creepy decorations right at the door that, like, I can't even walk in the door without almost having a heart attack. So I wish there was a way that we could still have that for the people that want it and that are, enjoy it yeah. but in such a way that those of us that, like, don't care to be exposed to all of that don't have to, I don't know, I am probably just need to get over myself. But No, I get what you're saying. Ever, I mean, like, I know to go back to that event I work at, it's a very family-friendly event, and every year there's at least one adult that shows up with some creepy, scary costume, and you always wonder, like, I mean, do you, do you know what, it, you, weren't, you weren't going to an adult party, you know, why are you wearing this random costume that's going to scare the heck out of all these little 10-year-old and younger kids who are trick-or-treating who see, you know, this gruesome monster or something like that? Yeah. Right. It's horrible. It's horrible. But then, if you think about, like, the origins of Halloween costumes and, and masks on Halloween were to kind of make people blend in with the, the dead who were walking around on that night. Um, so if you, if you really want to get upset about it, it's kind of people taking the, the holiday back to its roots. <laughs> and that, perhaps, you know, it's not that big of a deal, like... I'll, I'll get my costume. I mean, I'll make my own costume, really. It's, that's, that's just me. But I do, I, I know growing up there were, like, I had anxiety coming to the mm -hmm. Halloween because I, you know, I knew there were certain aisles in Walmart that I wasn't even going to be able, you know, like, I knew that was around the aisle. And so yeah. it, like, made me anxious um, even just to go to Walmart. Like, um, but yeah, I yeah, completely that sucks. yeah. That sucks. And the fact is as well that holidays in general, so Christmas is the biggest example of this obviously, but, but they start so early. So like as soon as, as 
yesterday when I was leaving work, I work at a university here in Japan. As I was leaving work, they were putting out the Christmas decorations. Yeah. Oh, Halloween. Right. Yeah. I, I would. I didn't go to any major stores this week, but it wouldn't surprise because a lot of times the week of the holiday, the stores start taking the stuff up because most people have already bought it. It wouldn't surprise me if a lot of the, like Walmart and stuff had it started rolling out some Christmas stuff this week. Oh, absolutely. Well, and like I know, um, I don't know how much you guys go to like Michaels or Hobby Lobby or anything or craft stores in general, but everyone's well, yeah. I know, um, you know, at least here in the Midwest, if you want to get your craft stuff on sale, you've got to buy it like. Like now is this month has been the prime time to get Christmas decorations on sale because they're just putting them out and they're like, and so they are, they're running them on sale here in the past two or three weeks. And so then, so you, you know, you buy this stuff super early and then stick it back. But like they, oh yeah, the, the Halloween stuff, I know I was in the Hobby Lobby last week and the Halloween stuff was on sale like there was like maybe one aisle of it left and the yeah. Christmas stuff is pretty much all out at this point I mean yeah the, speaking of the holidays getting longer like my subdivision um, there were people putting out Halloween decorations in their front yard like last couple of days of September first day of October so basically they had Halloween decorations up for an entire month hmm. but, I mean you used to uh, you did not I mean, you see it maybe like the week of Halloween or something, people would start putting stuff up, but it came almost like a full month thing, like Christmas decorations typically are. So, yeah, it, Halloween's definitely stretching farther and farther out. Um, well, and, and that said, I mean, I got home tonight, and I am I was already thinking, ooh, we could get down the Christmas decorations this weekend. Like, I'm already going there. And, of course, I love Christmas, but... Um, yeah, and I go there too because I typically just because to me it gets so crazy schedule wise in December. I typically try to do all my Christmas stuff some point early I November. Mean, I understand being prepared. It's just when you go to a store in November and the Christmas music's playing, it's a bit crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We sound like three grumpy old men. <laughs> yeah, we should change the name of the channel. <laughs> Project Grumpy. <laughs> all, those, all those children are we're putting the Christmas decorations out and we haven't even passed out the Halloween candy. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, it's kind of that same theme. Um, me and a couple people that um, this past week have been talking about a lot of stuff about Halloween related. And one thing we just talked about how like when we were kids, we basically all made our costumes. And now I would say like, 99% of the kids who have costumes, they're all store-bought costumes. Um, yeah. You kind of sounded like that grumpy old man, like, well, my day, we made our own costumes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell you, my favorite costume ever was the year I got to go as Ichabod Crane, and it was, like, the most... I, I consider it... Well, I might consider it my first cosplay, because it was a legit costume. I mean, I had a three-pointed hat, and uh, a pair of tights. I'm not sure where those came from, but we had them. And it was, like, it was legit. That costume was legit. Um, but there again, my mom made it. She she got the pieces. And, um, I think it's more fun to make your own costume anyway. That's I mean, that's part of the fun of cosplay, like trying to find pieces or figure out how can I make this piece work for this costume. Like, I agree, yeah, because I... I actually briefly thought about when I was going to Dragon Con this year. Like, well, maybe one of the because I wasn't planning on cosplaying anybody. I thought maybe I'll just I have the Waldo costume. Maybe I'll bring. It. And I was like, ah, I mean that's a store bought costume. I don't. That's not cosplaying. So I decided I'm just not going to do it because I just it's something I just bought. Um, right. Because uh, almost defeats the spirit. I think of cosplaying when you do this straight up just all store bought one. But um. um oh. I think you know that's a debate. Well, okay, that's well, that's. that's Let's qualify Because there's a difference between buying a cosplay that was designed to be, like, you, somebody else built this cosplay and you purchased it. You know, you bought it from yeah. them. Or even, like, from a store, like what you saw, Reb. Yeah. But there's a difference between that and buying, like, 
the Thor costume with the fake muscles that's made that's out of... That's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, going to Walmart and buying, like, the bags costume set. Yeah. yeah. That's not costume plan. You know, just going to buy that little $10 costume set where it's three pieces you put it on and you have a costume. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I would argue that there are there are two spirits of cosplay, as you because you said, you know, that's not in the spirit of it. Because there's there's the people who take pleasure in in making costumes. Like I I could happily be a costume maker for other people. I've I've seen things that I'd be like, I I really want to make that character, and I couldn't wear it. Like yeah. not by any stretch of the imagination. Maybe it's a girl, or maybe the guy's like a stick figure, or you know. I, Do it. I couldn't wear it by any stretch, but I'd love to make it. And then there's the other people who love to wear them and love to be the character, but have no creative skill whatsoever. And, and I mean, should we stigmatize them for not being able to make their own costume? No, and uh, to me, it's if there's somebody like designing it like that, I think that's still cosplay. To me, that's different. You know, from buying it from a designer is different than like you know how I got this Waldo costume, where I I think I went to either Target or Walmart and I just got it off the Halloween. Bro, you know. Yeah. And I feel like too, if you're gonna, if you're going to buy a cosplay, I mean, we we even use the word cosplay. It's a different. It's a completely different word. Yeah. It's not a costume. Yeah. It, it's a cosplay. And you, you know, when I think of buying a costume, I am thinking too of you know, like we're talking about off the rack, something that is is probably cheaply made. Yeah. That it was, you know, you're gonna wear it maybe once, maybe twice. Whereas a cosplay is something that somebody put time and effort into, that you know it's, or you know even if you buy a cosplay that was made by a, a company that does that regularly, like there's workmanship that goes into that, and so. Yeah, I would say that was the one thing that, of all the things when I attended Dragon Con this year that blew me away because the first time I'd ever attended a con, and so I'd seen pictures of people cosplaying, obviously online and videos and stuff, but. Until I actually saw it in person, to me it was hard to grasp of how much work people put into that type of stuff. And oh, yeah. A big con like Dragon Con, which is four days, I mean, people like Cat that was there, every day they had a different costume. So it wasn't like they just had spent all their time building one costume. You know, they'd spend months building four different costumes, and each costume was so intricate that it was just amazing. I mean, probably one of the most amazing ones I saw, somebody did an Aquaman and the costume part was amazing, but then they got a Segway and they turned the Segway into his underwater chariot. And just, <laughs> just the cosplay they had did on the Segway, you could tell they put so much work and effort on that that it was amazing. Now, I don't know if he built it himself or he bought it from somebody that built it, but you could still tell that had to have been like a multi month, if not a year project to design that costume. And it was even oh, a yeah. small touches. So when he actually started to move the Segway, they rigged up a, bu a bubble blower. So it blew out bubbles in the back to make it look like it was going underneath water. It was amazing. Wow. So if you could cosplay one character, or you know, do, if you could do one cosplay, regardless of of gender or body type or whatever, ideally, if you, who would that be? I, mm. One I thought was me. I saw one person that did a really good one at Halloween. Uh, not Halloween. Sorry, at Dragon Con. Um, and just probably because of my build, because I'm really tall and stuff, but they were decked out in a really accurate Chewbacca, Chewy costume, you know, <laughs> with everything. And to me, it'd be neat to wear a costume like that where you're basically almost completely masked, and nobody, you know, you're you're completely anonymous. You are the character, you know. Um, it was really amazing to see that, so I think that would be a fun one. And plus, I'm, you know, a huge Star Wars fan, so that would be awesome. Yeah, so going going to my original fandom, like the the most intricate long term project that I'm working on, and I started maybe about three or four months ago, and it'll be done by maybe next October. Um, but yeah, I'm making uh, Where Guru Ramon. So one of the one of the Digimon kind of evolves into a werewolf shaped character, and he has like brass knuckles and ripped jeans and but he's he's like proper big wolf head so for the same reasons as you Kyle you know having that mask and being like completely immersed into the character completely anonymous would be so amazing when I finally get it done yeah but I've had to take a lot of a lot of 
classes online and, and in conventions to, to make it accurately, so it's going to take a while. That's so cool, though, that you're working, you know, you have something really big like that that you're working on, you know? Yeah. And that's one thing, like, I think that's one reason why I would be an awful person at actually doing the costume design or something like that, because I'm, I'm really bad at taking something like that and doing the long time work on it. Like, I'm, you know, give me a week or two project, I'm good, but doing something like, all right, I'm going to have to work on this for four months to get the finished product, I would just, would drop off at some point. You know, mm. I procrastinate way too much, you know, I'd, like, well, I'll start working on it next week, next week, and, you know, it would just never get started, or I would get halfway done and drop it off. Not to mention, I'm not artistic at all, so I would have a chance of doing it. I would definitely have to hire a a designer. <laughs> well, I mean, between yeah. me and Reb and Cat and as, I don't know. Who, I mean, I think Danny, Danny and Holly have done some cosplay too, haven't they? Yes, yeah, some I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna say between between all of us, surely we can get you a costume put together. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We'll each make a part. We'll each make a part and then mail it to you. Part <laughs> <laughs> and I um. So my, I'm not sure if I'll. I'll go to Dragon Con again, but it's the weird part for me for Dragon Con if you cosplay. And I saw people doing this, so I live in the northern suburbs of Atlanta. And for Dragon Con, there's like 60,000 people in a like a four-block area of Atlanta. So you cannot get a parking spot near there. So you basically have to take mass transit the subway in. Um, so for me, that's like a 40-minute a train ride. And half the people on the train are just going to work in Atlanta. So you, so when I was going to Dragon Con, it'd be like half the people were going to Dragon Con. Of course, so I had my little name badge on and stuff like that. But the people that are direct up full on cosplay, the people that are just going to work, you know, like in their suits and stuff, they looked at those people like, "Who in the world are you? And am I safe? Are you?" Because <laughs> some of these people have you know full <laughs> swords and weapons and stuff, and it's like, you know, what world am I walking into on this train? Um, For me, that's half of the fun, just scaring the locals, you know. Yeah. <laughs> experience to see that interaction and sometimes you'd actually have people I saw people sitting on the same bench like some you know guy commuting to his job in Atlanta talking to the person next to him you know about their costume and like well who are you what is Dragon Con what is this you know I've never heard of cosplay before what exactly is this it was kind of an interesting um, cultural interaction you witnessed that's awesome. That's and awesome. It was one thing I'll say at uh, Con at Dragon Con, which I did not expect. I was surprised how many people actually cosplay. So I would say at Dragon Con, a con that big, I would say 70, 75% of people there are in costume. So if you're at Dragon Con and you're just dressed normal, you're in the minority. And you actually actually kind of feel a little weird while you're there. They're like, oh, I'm just in my wearing a nerdy t shirt and a blue jeans. The people in costume, they're the normal people at Dragon Con. Yeah, but then the whole thing about the the atmosphere and the the community of cons is that you won't be stigmatized. People oh, won't you're get not. down on you for that. You no. might feel weird, but no one looks at you like you're weird. Oh yeah, they don't you're definitely. Like no, they don't. Um, and that, I said that's one thing I did not expect at Dragon Con to to enjoy seeing all the cosplayers that much because the costumes were so amazing. I mean, the time in between the sessions were as entertaining as the. Um, the con itself. I mean, kind of give you an idea how big Dragon Con's going in Atlanta. The biggest parade in the city of Atlanta the entire year is the Dragon Con cosplay parade. <laughs> like one morning, they block off an entire section of downtown, and I think they said for that day for the parade, um, 100,000 people came to downtown Atlanta to watch the parade. That's well, 60, cool. only 60,000 people attended the entire con and bought passes. So that gives you the idea. Most people that came to watch the parade aren't people that came to the con. They just came to see the parade. So basically, if you're, if you're a cosplayer, you just register ahead of time and you walk in the parade. And it's costumes. People actually cosplay vehicles and stuff like that. Um, so oh, it's wow. been like a mainstream event in Atlanta. Which is, and it's a weird weekend because the same weekend of that, there's a huge college football game in Atlanta every year. So like half the people in, in Atlanta are these super nerds. And the other ones are like <laughs> diehard college football fans. So it's an interesting interaction there. Oh, I, I'd like to draw a Venn diagram of, of that. Like, yeah. See how big the center is. <laughs> That's awesome.
But I mean, on that one, I mean, definitely attending Dragon Cons definitely made me want to attend more cons in the future. Before I attended, I wasn't sure if I'd really like it, but I, you know, attending one definitely has me interested in attending others in the future. Be it Dragon Con every year, or checking out other cities' cons and stuff. Oh yeah, awesome! I mean, you've made me want to visit Dragon Con, and <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, um, I really enjoy that. Would be great, but it's really yeah. cool. I think one from what I talked to a few people there that go to a lot of the cons, and they said probably the thing that makes Dragon Con different than a lot of the major cons in the U.S. It's it's one of the few that hasn't really went to Hollywood yet, mm. um, so you don't get any like you know Marvel doesn't show up with the latest trailer for their movie and stuff, so it hasn't got too corporate. So they still have big sessions for like the big stars for TV and movies thing, but they all have sessions just about random small fandom. So, like, I attended a couple... They have a science track. So they had sessions on, like, how accurate is science in sci-fi movies. You know, oh, yeah. Random stuff like that. They had sessions on cosplay and how to design, you know... I think Kat attended some of those. Um, mm-hmm. They had fan panels where it was just literally 30 or 40 fans in a room saying, like, all right... I mean, David, uh, example, one was like Sleepy Hall. So it's just getting all the Sleepy Hall fans in one room and saying, like, all right, what did y'all think about season one? And it's just a group <laughs> discussion. There wasn't a star there. It was just diehard fans just for an hour just talking about, this is what I like about the show, this is what I hate about the show, you know, that type of stuff. Um, I can't wait for season two of Sleepy Hall. <laughs> it started um, here. Yeah. It's- I don't, I don't get access to, like, any of those things. Like, Hulu, I, I can't have an account. There's, um, I think there's Hulu Japan. Is there? Um, but I think you still need to have like a, an account and pay for it and stuff like that. But like, I don't have access to my net. I had to shut my Netflix down when I came to Japan because I can't access it. So I just well, don't. Welcome to our life because as far as Doctor Who and. Downton and everything else is concerned. We're like oh, yeah. six yeah. months or whatever behind, and then yeah, like, some of us are really behind because we're not able to watch it on cable. So, but to give you <laughs> our early preview of Sleepy Hall, I'd say, at least in my opinion, they season two's kept the momentum of season one. They have it. Um, they still seem to know what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm Sometimes worried that... You know, there's it, some it shows I've watched before where it's almost you get the feeling the writers or the creator didn't think they would get a second season. They're like, oh, I like the show, but we're going to get canceled. So when they get Shit. a second season, it's like they had no idea what they were going to do with it, and then they just lose all their momentum. Yeah, I think they probably like have a storyline mapped out already, and they're just falling in along. Awesome, awesome. I can't wait. And I know when me and David did our live show, the only thing I'm hoping they'll do at some point in season two, which they haven't done yet, is, you know, they do all this stuff, you know, with all this mythology built in with religion. And so they reference all these demons and individuals from purgatory or hell, but they never really reference any heavenly creatures. So I think yeah. that's... I mean, if there's one, you have to figure there's others. So at some point, you'd think they'd have to work in, like, an angel character or something like that. So I'm waiting for that just to see if they're going to go that way or not. But Yeah, yeah that cool. makes me wonder, since, you know, the mythology is based a lot out of Revelation, and yeah. there's, I mean, it's been a while since I've read Revelation, and it didn't make much sense um, when I did read it, and I'm a Christian, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I feel like, there's a, I mean, there's a lot in Revelation about beasts and demons sure. and all of that crazy stuff and the four horsemen and all of that. But there is, I mean, there are angels and, yeah, you know, and so that's where I, I do wonder too. I hope on the one hand that we get some of that, and on the other hand, I don't. I hope that it doesn't become a sci-fi angels versus demons. I agree with you on that. So yeah. it's very grounded in. Americana and American history and For sure. sort of this working class, we've, you know, um, which I really like. The thing that I feel, I, I agree with you, Kyle, absolutely. I feel that like we totally have kept the momentum. But I do know, I have noticed, too, that thing where 
um, we we had this all of this roller coaster of season one, and and now I feel like we've not backed off of the pace as much as we've said, okay, we're here now. We can yeah we can develop our story. It doesn't feel quite so frenzied. I would to, agree on that. To get to you know to figure out the next thing and the next thing and the next thing we're kind of just experiencing it almost in real time I guess and that's mm. and I wonder if that's where like because we know okay season 1 worked people yeah. like this yeah. we like this concept so we know you know we don't have to fit everything in because we know we're going to have some longevity here so I do I do see you know setting not necessarily like dramatically setting up stuff that I go, oh, I know that's going to come back in the middle of season three, but yeah. I, I I have felt a little bit more of that sort of um, setting the pace of a more okay, we're in this now for the long haul. Yeah, so. that was really the end of season yeah. one though. That just wow. <laughs> One thing on um, Sleepy Hall that I had not thought of actually until I attended Dragon Con. Well, I think it was probably because it's a very female perspective of this. But one thing a lot of the female fans they said they liked a lot was there's no built-in romantic tension between Abby and Ichabod, which the female yeah. fans said they really liked a lot because they said as a female fan for a lot of shows it becomes really frustrating because anytime there's a male lead and a female lead it's like oh we have to get them together at some point. Yeah, you know, they basically said, you know, as a woman, we can be friends with a man and not want to be their, you know, significant other at some point, and um, which I never really thought of that. But until they said that, I thought, well, that is very true. And you know, at no point did season one did they ever hint that like, oh, Abby has a crush on Ichabod or anything like that. You know, they never went there. Um, which when I thought about, it, well, that is really cool, and it gives it a little bit different element than a lot of shows have because there's not that will they, won't they, tension between them two. And they're, they're even almost, and I think, yeah, we should be spoiler-free here, but yeah. uh, <laughs> there's been a couple of moments that were almost the opposite of that, where it was like, almost like, really? That's that's not even entering our brains right now. Like, uh, yeah. we're, why would we even go there? That's not the I point. Mean, there's, there's sex jokes, though. There's sex jokes. And, like, they'll make jokes... At, at the expense of, so obviously because of Ichabod being who he is and not understanding the references to sex that he's making, they, they they make those jokes. But it's never like hinted that he's trying to make advances. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I like that. Yeah. Have you guys... Since we've talked, we're talking shows. I guess I, I forget. Am I the only one that watches once anymore? Yeah, I stopped like four episodes into season two. Yeah, I, I never even tried. I never even started. I went, I was, was it season three where they went to uh, Neverland? Neverland was the beginning of season three. All right, yeah. So I, I watched like two or three episodes of that, and then I gave up. I tapped out. <sighs> Okay, well, I'll just be over here then. Um, <laughs> it's really good. It's still really good. I think my mom and sister still watch it. Um, I know they watched it last year. I haven't, I haven't actually heard them say if they're watching it this year or not. They they really liked last year. I know they said they really liked the storyline as it developed and stuff, but I think I got so frustrated with season two that when season three started and I didn't see a change, I was like, yeah, I'm... I'm done, and I had an issue last year that there was a ton of new shows like Sleepy Hollow that started that I just figured out, like, I don't have time to watch all this stuff. I have to drop something yeah. to keep up, and once upon a time, it's just what I dropped. You know, mm. you know blame Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> Let me stop watching. Once <laughs> time. I mean, what about Gotham? Did anyone watch Gotham? I've, I've been watching Gotham, Gotham so far. It's, it's okay. Um, I thought the Last episode, they started show prom. I've heard a few people say they're dropping too many references right away. Like they're trying to introduce every single Batman villain and say, like, oh, this is how this person got their start, without actually developing the characters any. Hmm. 
Yeah. And I think they did the first few episodes. The last episode was one of the first times where I, they actually did some character development. They did it revolve around, oh, this is how you know the penguin got to start as a villain, or this is how Catwoman came about. Is yeah. you know like it's a random character who's really not a major Batman, you know, um, canon character. Just like oh, this is how this person became a this type of police officer. Um, I think they need to do more of that because at the moment, I, they didn't really make you care about any of the characters, which is yeah. the opposite. Like Sleepy Hollow, something did an awesome job after like a few episodes of Sleepy Hollow, episode you know season one. You cared about all those characters. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, they build up a world, but at the same time, they develop the characters. Gotham hasn't really done a good job on the character development side so far. Um, yeah, but if if I don't feel an attachment to the characters after the first maybe one or two episodes, I'm I'm just not going to watch it. So that's why, I mean, everyone raves, absolutely ransom raves about how amazing Breaking Bad is, but I just didn't feel it. I didn't I've feel never any attachment it. to him. As, I figure at some point I'll go back and rewatch it. But it's one of those things I didn't catch it at the beginning. And a lot of times, if I don't watch a show from the beginning. I almost wait till it's over and then go back and rewatch it. Yeah, that's what I'm tempted to do with Game of Thrones. Yeah, like, I never. And I'm kind of waiting. I I want to something like that. With I know the books are great too. I I have had a chance to read the books. I want to go read the books at some point and then go back and rewatch that show because I think I would really love that. But it's just, you know, making the time to do it. Yeah. So um, many. Things. So. Uh, on shows, I would Gotham kind of reminds me a little bit about. I don't know if either of y'all watch Marvel's Agents of Shield. Um, no, I want to watch that though. I, I think they to. had the same issue. Like the first season, like the first half of the season was really bad and somewhat boring. But you kept on watching because you know well, all the movies are really good. At asking, and the same time that Captain America: The Winter Soldier came up, the storyline for season one of the show tied in with the movie. And then after the movie came out, it's like they found their groove and they really hit it going. And now they're doing an awesome job. So, like, if Gotham wasn't connected with Batman, I'd probably already stopped watching it. But I like Batman so much. I was like, at some point, maybe they're going to get their act together and it's going to become an awesome show. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, too, where I have to remind myself, you know, a lot of the shows that I love have are shows that I have been off the air, and so I was able to watch them, just binge them, you know, or yep. Netflix them, all in one sitting. No, well, not all in one sitting, but, you know, episode after episode after episode. And yeah, they, yeah, Lost Girl is that for me, Lost Girl. And I, and I think about, like, you know, Stargate, where it was probably season three or season four before we were really like, okay, this is awesome. Yeah, it takes a while for shows to find the rhythm. Yeah, and so that's where I feel like with a new show, sometimes I almost want to stick with it a couple of seasons just to say, okay, I understand this is how TV shows work sometimes. The yeah. first season is not that great. And so... Yeah, sometimes I think the important word. J.J. Abrams seems to have got it right, though. I mean, if you look at um, Fringe before yeah. Sleepy Hollow, and he just seems to know exactly how to do things to, to make about, things. On Fringe, um, I attended a fan panel at Dragon Con on Fringe, and there were some people that had some, like, mind blowingly like, theories about Fringe. That, like, I mean, it was, they put so much thought into how that show worked, it was amazing. You can tell they mapped out, like, how that world worked to develop all these theories and stuff. And yeah. on um, Stargate, actually, I, I did think about you, David, at Dragon Con a couple times, because I attended three Stargate fan panels. Oh. And then I was like, oh, David would probably love these. So one was on um, archaeology in Atlantis and how Stargate incorporated that. But that was okay, but then there was the two that were the most fun. There was this one panel that they just titled, What If? Basically, it's a thing you just shouted out, like, All right, what if this had happened this episode? How would the show develop differently? Yep. Little stuff like that. Hmm. <laughs> Or even stuff like, you know, how would the show have been different if they'd kept the movie cast instead of, you know, the TV cast team about, you know, that type of stuff. I love that show um, so much. Oh, I, I love it. And I miss it so much. And then the last panel was about, which I'm assuming you heard, um, you know, they're going to reboot the movies. Yes, I'm so excited. So there, there was an entire panel about that because, you know, they're basically throwing out the TV shows. 
and they're re- going to refilm the first movie and make a new trilogy. Um, you know what? I am completely okay with that. And yeah, I'm fine with it, too. And that's what most people in the room were saying. They're fine with it just to get new Stargate content. But it's still going to be interesting to see <laughs> where they go. Well, and I, and from, from my person, you know, not just to get new Stargate content, but we have, you know, we have this canon that we can fall back on. We, we love, you know, we love SG-1. I love Atlantis. And um, as an artist, you know, everything I've read, you know, it's these original writers that yep. are getting to make the trilogy they originally wanted to make. Yep. And so as an artist, that's, my brain is like, okay, well, what was it? Because here we have, you know, 15 seasons of content, yeah. and that's not what you originally had in mind. Like, <laughs> like, and so as an artist, I'm just so excited to see the what they originally intended, how they originally, you know, what they originally wanted for those characters. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting um, to see how it... And there was a lot of talk about, you know, people that had articles, interviews from the original creators and what they'd been saying for years about what they intended really. Like, apparently, originally, the idea was the Stargate only connected Earth with that one other planet. There weren't other Stargates. That was one original Mm -hmm. idea. And obviously, the TV show threw that out the window. You know, so there was a lot of stuff that the way the TV show was completely different than the way the movie people wanted to go. Um, So it's... most people in the room seem to accept it because it was the original people. I think a lot of them would have been mad if it was just some like random person had bought the rights and said, yeah. "All right, now I want to remake it and you know forget all the old stuff." But in fact, there's people that actually created the canon, and be willing to accept it. And I, I I would agree with that too. If it was just a, a big Hollywood company wanting to reboot, we have this, we have this. Um, what am I trying to say? This this franchise, and we want to let's reboot it. Yeah. And let's bring in some hotshot writer that's popular right now, and pay them a lot of money to to write a movie, and then it turns out to be crap. Like that's that's different than the original character, the original creators saying, "Let's do what we started out to do." Like that's what's getting me excited. So now you're talking reboots, and we've already talked J.J. Abrams. So Star Trek, wow. <laughs> yeah, the new the new movies are really good and really exciting, and they've they've developed kind of their own canon. And the the Star Trek fandom are, are split, I think, on it. Yeah, from what I've heard, the, uh, the diehard Trekkers view it differently. Like I always view myself as kind of like a casual Star Trek fan. <laughs> so for me. I mean, to me, the brilliant thing they did with that first movie where they kind of reset the franchise with, you know, yeah. all the stuff with time change. They basically, they reset the franchise without wiping out the old canon. So it's like, yeah. the old canon still exists. That's just a different timeline. So it's like, you know, we're still going to respect the original stuff, but we're going, we're not beholden to it anymore. And to me, the way they did it was kind of a respectful manner um, versus the example with Star Wars where... They decided, all right, we're going to make more movies after Return of Jedi, but oops, there's books and stuff there. All right, that stuff no longer exists and counts anymore. Yeah. yeah. Or they just threw it out. Yeah, I, I, when, I read, when I read that news, I thought of you, and I, yeah. a little part of me people sobbed. Like that, you kind of felt disrespected, like, you know, for people that had spent, like, 20 years. I mean, if you bought all the Extended Universe books, you've probably bought 200 books. You know, and mm. the amount of time and money that you spent into it, and then not even like, all right, we're just going to have two canons now. It's like, all right, this no longer exists. You know, you, you kind yeah, of go a little disrespectful, you know. Where, like, I, the way they handle Star Trek, I think, even though I know some fans don't like the way they did it, I still think they tried to be respectful with the fans and say, all right, we're not touching the stuff you like. We're just going to take it in a new direction. Well, and that speaks, too, to, you know, to J.J. Abrams and his his tact, and we've seen that, you know, from from most of his work. He's very he's very respectful to the original to the original work and he wants to do something interesting and something new, but something that is also you know, pays it's pays its dues. Yeah, and that's yeah. I think a good example of that, which I don't know if y'all have y'all ever watched uh, Super Eight? No. Oh yeah. It's a great movie, and it basically it's his, you know, it's basically J.J. Abrams saying, like, I loved E.T., 
Steven Spielberg, can I make my own version of E.T. just with a different twist? And so Steven Spielberg, you know, executive produced it. But it's basically, when you watch it, it's very similar story-wise to E.T., but, you know, he took his own spin on it. But at the same time, he was very respectful. It wasn't like he was ripping off E.T. He just took it in his own little different direction. And right. you can tell it's just J.J. Abrams. It was almost his love letter to E.T. Like, I love E.T. I want to make a similar movie like this for this generation. Right, and that, I mean that really speaks to the to him as an artist, just the way that he's been respectful to to the work, and I, I understand too. You know, the the Trekkie community has been kind of fractured on that, but I feel like we're fractured on a lot of things. Whether it's your favorite captain or yeah. who's the best doctor, or like we, I mean, there's the the fa- the canon is so wide at this point between so many shows and movies and like there's it's just so I don't know it's different and that's one of the things too where like a lot of people hold Star Trek up against Star Wars and say it's one or the other and I'm like you're comparing a t- TV franchise based franchise to a movie based franchise and both have kind of expanded beyond that. So it's like, it's almost apples and oranges at that point. Yeah, and to me, it's, 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 they're so different. I mean, obviously Star Wars is more, you know, fantasy-based, where sci-fi, you know, sorry, Star Trek's more science-based and, you know, involves more politics and that side of it. Mm-hmm. That, you know, I never viewed them as like, to me, they're so different, they're not even really comparable. They're, they're just different types. Of, they're in different genres of sci-fi almost. Um, to me, Star Trek compares to a lot of other different sci-fi better than like Star Wars. Star Wars compares more to like Lord of the Rings and stuff. Yeah, it, Star Wars like, isn't really sci-fi in the strictest sense of the word. No, it's, it's more fantasy. It's, it's yeah. more like, yeah, it's like a space western kind exactly. of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Except it's yeah. not as good as the space western. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the just yeah, saying. the definitive space western. <laughs> Just saying. Like, Let's not talk Firefly because <laughs> OMG. We will all be tears and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> so, David, you didn't answer your own question. I didn't, and I was wondering if anybody was going to ask me that because the minute I asked it, I was like, I do not have a good answer for this. Um, <laughs> I, Please tell me you've been thinking about it for the whole time we've been talking about other stuff. A little bit, yes, I have. Um, and it's been nice that we've been running through fandoms because that helps me remember who all I love. Yeah. Um, I would love to, I think, um, gosh, I don't know. I think I would love to be Sokka from wow. Wow. Bender. I, yeah. I, lo- I mean, he is just so, he's so cool. He's... Um, kind of nerdy, you kind of dorky. How are you with boomerangs? What? How are you I'm hor- well, horrible. And I'm also, you know, not skinny and lanky. Um, but he, I mean, I love, the thing I love about Sokka is that he has no real powers. He's, I mean, he does. he's not a bender. And yet he is one of the yeah. most valuable members of the team. Um, oh, yeah. Definitely. Overall, and you see how he contributes, and I, I think he's amazing. I would love to be Sokka. Although it was funny when the summer when I first shaved my head, and my dad, what he meant to say was that I could be an Airbender for Halloween. But yeah. he's something about blue tattoos and on your head, and it did not translate at all. I thought maybe <laughs> I thought I was going to be like an avatar from the movie or like oh. I don't know where he was headed. It was like 15 minutes of what are you talking about before we finally was like oh, you think I'm going to... So, I don't know. I've never seen Airbender but I will say it. Everybody that's watched it, I've heard nothing about positive things. So I think it's something I, at some point I do want to watch because yeah, everybody I've uh, seen this watch it that just raves about it. The, that's yeah. one of those shows the animation is so good I mean, it was done. It was done in. Was it done in Japan? I forget. Um, no, this is the thing. Like, I've had this. I've had this conversation with some of my friends. Like, what? What is anime? What constitutes anime? Can we say that Ruby is anime? Can we say that Ang is anime? But because they're they're like Western, they're animated in 
in the States. So does that mean that they're not anime? Well, on that argument, the Simpsons are anim animated in, like, South Korea, so does that make them anime? <laughs> Yeah, well, this is right, in Japan. You have to distinguish because anime just means cartoons. In Japanese, the... it's a it's a borrowed word from French, and anime just means cartoons. So you have to say Japanese anime if you mean what people in the states or people in the UK will call anime. Yeah. So yeah, here the the Simpsons is anime. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, Adventure Time is anime here in in Japan, yeah. so that that's the kind of irony of ironies. I would say I would re highly recommend it though. It's like because the animation is so good, the character development is amazing, and just like I mean, it's from having watched it now a couple times and gone back like it's from episode one all the way through. It's, like, consistent and characters, like, you get to the end, I, I do remember, like, the the end of my first run-through of watching that, just being so blown away, and then going back and ha watching it a second time and realizing how much is in those first few episodes in that first season. Yeah. It's like, you forget that those characters have been there the whole time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, the fantastic thing about it as well is that, you know, it's, it's extremely moralistic, but it doesn't kind of jam it down your throat as a, like an Aesop's fable kind of thing. But, you know, right. it's, it's really telling you good things about how to be with people and how to, how to really take care of the place and the people that you're surrounded by, but it doesn't do it in a, in a way that's kind of preachy. Right. Well, and because it is, because, too, it's not about you have to be a good person. It's about you have to treat people well. You know, it's about, it's other-centric. It's about doing what's right for the world and what's right for the people around you. Definitely. Not, here's a list of rules and do's and don'ts. Yeah. Have a nice life. Like, which yeah. is what, I mean, that's what morality should be about anyway. I think so. I agree. Mm. So, yeah, maybe you could cosplay Appa. <laughs> I could! That would be awesome! I don't know how I would do being on all fours all day. Maybe I could get somebody to cosplay Appa with me, and we'll do, like, the a take on the old donkey costume. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the Chinese dragon. Yeah. yeah. We could totally do it. Totally do it. Uh, and we could, we could get like, a little play. flush ang. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of kind of walking weird and cosplay, one of the cooler cosplays I saw at Dragon Con, somebody cosplayed uh, Jack Skeleton from The Nightmare Before Christmas, but to make it even more, um, I guess, impressive, he cosplayed walking on stilts. Mm. Everywhere he was, um, he was, so he was like ten feet tall. Um, so it was amazing when you see him walking down the sidewalk. It was like you were seeing some monster. It, I mean, he did not look human because the way the stilts worked, you weren't walking like a human. It was really weird and impressive to see. Mm, that's cool. And dedication. So, stilts yeah. are hard. Yeah, that's the time I was like, I don't know if I'd be wanting to walk around in stilts in a crowd of. 60,000 people jammed in a sidewalk. But he was yeah. doing that. Or she was doing that. I mean, I have no idea if it was a he or a she, but... So for my cosplay, the, the ultimate ambitious one, the first thing that I had to buy was a pair of women's high heels. <laughs> because... Um, so this is like a werewolf kind of character, and, and you know that the canine feet yeah. Are kind of shaped yeah. very differently. So um, the way that I've devised my costume is around these these high heels with the back cut off, and I'll have to walk around like on my tiptoes all day That's without awful. any support. Behind me. That's gonna be legit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally looking forward. <laughs> I mean, I've... Although, you know, if I come to Dragon Con and I wear it, 
I'm going to have to have a separate case on the plane just for my costume. Because <laughs> the head is like this big and all the parts of the body. And, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Some of those people that had their. I'm not sure how they got their stuff to Atlanta, especially if you had to travel all far away, or even if you were driving in and you were staying at the hotels, which a lot of the diehard cosplayers stay at one of the four host hotels, just it makes it easier for them logistically because they can go up to the room and do costume adjustments and stuff like that. But yeah. so much of that stuff is so elaborate. I mean, I don't know how they would fit all their stuff in their cars or SUVs or whatever, so I don't, I don't know how they handled all that stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't know. There's got to be a way. Yeah, there, I mean, I'm <laughs> sure if you're in the cosplay community, you probably know all the, the tricks and tools probably. Yeah, you know, yeah, figured it, out pretty hinges. Soon. hinges are your friend. Having something that folds is so important. Folds or collapses, comes apart. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, so we managed to come full circle. We're talking about costumes again. <laughs> That's Back. because we're awesome like that. Yep. Yeah, this is why I love this channel. <laughs> we'll have a we'll have a live show about costumes and Halloween, and then talk about J.J. Abrams and Ang. <laughs> Geek out. Yeah. So, so did you guys? Is, uh, I've oh. been immersed in my new job. Did we? Have you guys? Did you guys upload this week? Do you guys have nerdy pleasures and all that already covered? Yeah, I, I uploaded a video. Um, uh, see it on Tuesday, yeah. So, yeah, I did a, if you haven't seen it, I did a hybrid costume uh, of my Waldo, Waldo, Waldo costume with the Afro hippie that I did. So I did, like, Waldo with an Afro. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to oh, finish this and watch was, that video. My nerdy pleasure was the, uh, seeing the Age of Ultron trailer. Ah. Uh. Which yeah, really I, I watch, I watch that. But my my tip with that is that I I always watch Marvel movie trailers with the sound off. Yeah. So I get to see, oh that looks really cool, but I don't hear any of the any of the lines. So it's it's kind of you can't ever watch a trailer when it and it be spoiler free. But it's kind of it keeps me more anticipated. I, I like to have. I understand. There's some movies like. Just the way I know they're done, I try to avoid all stuff. So, like, typically Christopher Nolan movies, because his plots are so intricate, I try not to see any trailers for his stuff. Mm. His stuff is so different from everything that I want to be completely separate. So, like, I'm so excited to see Interstellar. I've been ignoring all trailers. I just want to go in fresh and have no idea. Cause I, remember I did the same thing with Inception. I really didn't have any idea what Inception was about. And he, you know, go in there and he's like, you know, wow. You know, same with like the last Batman. You know, you had all those spoilers getting released. Like, oh, this is gonna be the villain. This is what's happening. Here's still shots of them filming in Pittsburgh and stuff. I just have ignored all that stuff. Yeah. Um, with Facebook, it's so hard to to completely stay. Yeah, you, you you'll get a few snippets. Yeah, there's no way you can completely cut yourself off anymore. Um, yeah. But the really cool part about the Age of Ultron trailer, the music they did in the background of the trailer. Was a song from Pinocchio. <laughs> so I mean, how I mean, who would have thought of doing? Um, I can't even think of the name of the song. It's the one where he's like, um, "I have no strings now." Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the official name of that song is. So that's the song that's playing in the background of the trailer, and it works brilliantly. But I don't know who thought of that. Like, let's take this comic book superhero mural movie and combine it with a song from Pinocchio. Of course, I know it works because yeah. Disney owns Marvel and <laughs> Pinocchio. <laughs> so. I'm sure that's why, oh, we own the rights to that song, let's reuse it, but I mean, yeah. it worked brilliantly. <laughs> yeah. So, for me, my nerdy pleasure was um, getting to teach at least a small portion of Japan about the fact that in the UK, we celebrate an execution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you're referring to Goth Ox Day? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, right. on bonfire night, we uh, we light fires to remember the fact that someone was foiled in their plot. I, but I tried to give a little bit more of the history about it and and make it seem, oh, well, you know. And now 
just like with Christmas and Halloween, like the the origins of it have almost entirely been forgotten, and they don't they don't tie up. So now bonfire night is just a time for for people to shoot off fireworks and and eat apples coated in sugar and you know. So you mean they're they're no longer remembering the gunpowder the gunpowder plot. However, that poem. Yeah. Goes. So like remember remember yeah, the gunpowder plot or whatever. Yeah. Gunpowder, treason, and plot. There you go, yeah. Um, yeah, like, I, th- when I came to Japan, it was the first time I'd ever heard it referred to as Guy Fawkes Day. Like, okay. Yeah, that's we don't the thing. We don't I just have heard it heard, heard referred to it that way here as Guy Fawkes Day, yeah. 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 But yeah, the, the the link to the gunpowder plot and to Guy Fawkes is almost completely gone. And you know, before they used to they used to burn effigies of Guy Fawkes yeah. on the bonfires. <laughs> and like that's that's a really barbaric thing to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean I, I made it fun for the kids. Like I showed pictures of Fireworks and, and potatoes wrapped in tin foil and all that sort of stuff. So, hopefully, they don't go away thinking that us Brits are completely gruesome and love the <laughs> idea of roasting a dude. <laughs> the way Japan's changed it, it kind of reminds me of the way the U.S. has changed uh, Cinco de Mayo, which is a Mexican holiday that we've completely changed and has nothing to do with, with Mexico. Yeah, that's how they celebrate. I mean, I've heard people from Mexico say Cinco de Mayo is not even a major holiday in, in Mexico, and how they celebrate it is not. Basically, in America, it's like, all right, it gives bars an excuse to have a full weekend of drinking parties and stuff. Yep. Um, I think my nerdy pleasure of the my nerdy pleasure is obvious. Well, not obviously, but um, I finished Buffy, um, which was amazing. <laughs> And wonderful. And I actually, I was watching, um, I was watching Buffy and Angel like together. Yeah. When, and then I got to the point where I was like, okay, I, I, I like Angel, but not as much as I want to finish Buffy right now. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of left Angel out in the cold there for a second, which is fine because he's a vampire. And <laughs> um, I just kind of binged Buffy, and it was so good. Um, it was so good. There was a season there, and I think we all know which season that was, where I was like, this is tough. Like, heart pulled out of my chest, what's going on with these people, um, rough. And then it paid off in the end, which was wonderful. And um, it actually reminded me of, because um, Gilmore Girls is also on Netflix now. Yeah. So I'm watching that again for I don't know what time this is, but um, there's a season uh, or two, uh, a season and a half of Gilmore Girls later in the seasons that is really rough. It's like that. It's like everything that can go wrong does go wrong, <laughs> and everyone hates each other, and you're just like, "What are we so doing?" And then it's off one where she's a really young mother. Yes, and her daughters. Like- close to our age. Yes, and yeah. they're like best yeah. friends, and it's in New England, and it's gorgeous and hilarious. Yeah, I've, seen a, I've seen a few episodes. The episodes I've always seen I've enjoyed, but I've never actually watched them in order. Like I've never sat through and watched a season of it. Oh, it's yeah, so exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's all always look great. You, you tell it's very smart. Um, and okay. I get what you're saying when you compare it to Buffy, because the dialogue in both of those, the show... Sharp and rapid fire. Yeah, it's um, witty. I mean, yeah, I've always, I'm the opinion that Buffy might be the best written TV show of ever. I'm not saying Buffy's the best show of all time, but when you go back and just watch how it's written and how the dialogue works, it's I mean it's amazing. And of course, I think you saw the same fly with everything that you know Whedon's done from Firefly. I mean, you could probably argue that Firefly is just as well written as Buffy, but you didn't mm-hmm. you see. It develop because Buffy got more seasons. Um, I mean, the dialogue, <laughs> he does such a good job of dialogue. It's just... Well, I think that was the thing for me was, you know, with Buffy, and I don't think, not that Angel is any less witty, because I don't think it is, 
but you don't have Buffy there with all of her quips and Ooh. her like one-liners that she throws that she wastes on vampires that she's going to dust in two seconds yeah, yeah, yeah. and no one else is around to hear them but us. Like, you just didn't have that. And so I was really kind of craving that as I was watching those episodes of Angel. And so that's where... And now, I mean, I'm, I've gone back and I'm, I'm finishing up Angel now, but um, not that it's any worse because it's not... But I was, it is, it is so witty. And Gilmore Girls is as well. There's so much pop culture packed into every episode. Like dozens of references that just fly by you and you don't catch them until you watch it again and you actually know what they're talking about. Um, there, I mean, and just literally stuff like that in the past couple of years, you know, as I've grown as a person in, in my knowledge of the world or whatever, that I learn about stuff and then I go back and watch an episode of Gilmore Girls and like, I get the reference now, yeah. and it is so. It is. It's witty and it's jam packed and it's the characters are great and, I mean, an early Melissa McCarthy like. I don't know. I love it, but so yes. Yeah, so that was my nerdy pleasure. I finished Buffy, and had to go lay down after that and have feels because it was, <laughs> like, and it's one of those. I guess. I don't want to spoilers for people that have watched it, but it was one of those at the end of that that I was like, that's it? And then I remembered there's other seasons of Angel, and I think, aren't there comic books or something? Yeah, too? There's like, I think comic. season, like there was a whole season of Buffy that was just in graphic novel form yeah. or comic book form. Yeah, cause they never, they, they kind of ended it that way on purpose because they wanted to delete, the initial plan was, Faith was going to have her own TV show after. Mm. She said, show Geller was done making Buffy. She didn't want to do it anymore, so they had to end it. They wanted to do a show around Faith, and then there was also an idea of doing kind of a prequel show about Giles and about him being younger in England and how he became a watcher. And just for yeah. a variety of reasons, they just never happened. And I eventually, Josh, you know, Josh just moved on to other projects, and they just kind of, you know, went away, but, um, yeah, I, I know Danny's read the the comics, I think, I actually said they're fairly good, I've never read any of the ones that do, you know, expand on the storyline and stuff. Well, I've never been huge into comics, but I think if I was going to get into comics and graphic novels, it would probably be Buffy and, and MLP, obviously, um, <laughs> but you laugh, but... Yeah, so this is this is the this is the thing, right? Because the reason that friendship is magic works, in my opinion, is because of the way that the characters are and the way that it's animated and, and the fact that it all wraps up in the in the one episode and Oh absolutely. And I don't I don't know how that would translate to the page, you know? Because everything's so much more permanent there. I do get that. And it's uh, and there again, I haven't... I'm not a huge comics person, and I only have time in my life for so many hobbies and fandoms and ness. Um, and so I really haven't read the comics. But I do, I do wonder about that. And I know there's, like... Because um, there's Dr. Who's comics, as, at least one that I've seen as well. And so, I don't know. Yeah, like, the, like, Pinkie Pie, I just don't think would translate to the page at all. Like, how do you, how do you make the visual comedy of Pinkie Pie yeah. in, a, in a comic book? Yeah. That, yeah, so, I know it's a weird thing to think about in depth, but I had. <laughs> and that's my, that's my two cents on it. <laughs> Oh no, that would be a great question to ask if anybody has read the comics and what what they think of how they translate. Well, that sounds like your question for the week. There you go. That's my question. Have you read the MLP comics and did it translate to the page? And should we spend our time on it because we don't have a lot of that? There's so many fandoms. Too little time. Yeah. So need to point that out. In case you missed my vi my video, my question was based off the trailer and. What movie that's coming out sometime soon are you most excited to see? 
Uh, my answer was the next Hunger Games movie, probably because I'm an extra in it, and I just want to see if I actually make the movie or not. But beyond that, I'm excited for the movie. Um, yeah. The follow-up one was I'm super excited, as I mentioned earlier, to see Interstellar and to see what Christopher Nolan's doing with that. Mm. I will tell you, and it reminded me, I had this thought earlier, I don't because we talked about, because you said that thing about trailers, and the thing that I am excited for is Into the Woods, which is coming, I think, on Christmas. I think it's coming out, but, like, oh, my goodness. As a musical nerd, I mean, it's Stephen Sondheim. Everybody's in it. Like, Meryl Streep is playing the witch, and Anna Kendrick is playing Cinderella, and, like, Chris Pine is playing one of the princes, and I'm just so excited to is see it. it. Wow. Is it Johnny Depp in it? Yes, he's playing the wolf. That's what I, was like, I thought I'd heard Johnny Depp was in it. You know? and, I, and that was one of those, I saw the trailer, and I was instantly like, okay, i got to watch that again. Okay, i got to watch that again. Like, and speaking of nerdy thing, I'll do it. I did a nerdy Johnny Depp thing related yesterday, so I'm in charge of the event next week, and um, it has a Hollywood theme, so I've been hiring impersonators for the event. So yesterday I hired a Johnny Depp impersonator. So, hey, I, I was trading emails with him, and we decided he's going to come dressed as Captain Jack Sparrow and stuff. So That's awesome. That, that was an interesting experience. So I now know how much impersonators charge us their standard fees and stuff, and it's apparently a very good living because he's getting – he gave us a discount, and he still gets paid a lot of money. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. I don't, I don't think I've got the, the talent to impersonate anyone, so I can't really go into that line of work. I'm an actor, and I can't impersonate anyone, so <laughs> there's that. Maybe I could get into mascotting. I wonder how that would work, like a full suit. <laughs> too hot. It's too hot and gross. Oh, I'm warm right now. All I'm wearing is this fur hood. So <laughs> I did. Um, I wore the, oh, it was some turtle costume for the book club week at school one year. after Like, after school, for 15 minutes during dismissal, and it was too much. Wow. Yeah. No, thank you. Well, on the cosplay, that's one thing. I don't know how people that do those types of costumes make it at Dragon Con, because Dragon Con in Atlanta is Labor Day weekend. And if you know Atlanta, Atlanta's week nickname is Hot Atlanta. Atlanta's viewed as one of the hottest cities in the country. So that weekend, it was um, mid-'90s, every day with humidity, so it was like 100 degrees. Uh, you hot, even if you weren't in costume. And then you had those people that had like the full body costumes. I don't yeah. know how they how they dealt with it. <laughs> nice. So my, my question for the viewers um, is about the family costumes that we were talking about quite early on. Like, did you ever have family costumes growing up? or group costumes in general. So I love seeing people go out as a team, like a, like a group theme, uh, like maybe a troop of Power Rangers or, or all of you dressed as characters from one particular book or one particular movie. Oh, my gosh. That reminds me, since you asked it and I'll answer it. Um, we didn't have, like, a family costume growing up ever, but there was one year for Spirit Week in high school that it was Superhero Day, and some friends of mine and I, we went as the Incredibles, which you mentioned, a family of Incredibles. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we were high school students on a budget, and we thought of this, like, two days before we were supposed to do it, we all wore red T-shirts, and then we wore, like, plain clothes over the top of it, and we made the Incredibles <laughs> logo out of, like, construction paper and taped it on the inside of our shirts. And so I wore, like, a button-down shirt that was unbuttoned just so that you could kind of see the top of it, oh, and it was awesome. Yeah, that's very that's cool. cool. I've seen a couple of Clark Kent's at costume events, um, but my favorite, my favorite, like, incognito costume was uh, a guy that I photographed at a convention in the Midlands, and he had an arc reactor, just just an arc reactor, just taped to his chest. Or it wasn't taped, you know, using proper... Right. But he, he was just 
just generally standing around having drinks and chatting to everyone with an arc reactor. So he was That's Tony awesome. Stark. Hmm. <laughs> cool. So do we have anything else to discuss or do we want to call the live show at end at I believe the close to the two hour mark? Oh yeah. good. We did well today, I think. We basically <laughs> made a we basically made a project nerdy movie documentary pretty much. <laughs> I think technically since yeah. this came out before the end of the year, we actually probably can enter it into the Oscar consideration. <laughs> like, oh, you have to, I think the rule for the Oscars is you just have to get one theater to show it, and then it's eligible. So if anybody oh, has been cool with a, a theater somewhere... <laughs> mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start writing my acceptance speech. I don't know what you're talking about, David. <laughs> Right. You haven't already had yours written. I've been practicing mine for like ever. Okay. Thank you. Literally. Thank you. And I would like to thank um, my mom and, <laughs> and Jesus and um, all of you for being here to witness this auspicious occasion. <laughs> oh, we need to have another PN Awards week. That was that was so amazing. <laughs> You know. Although what actor hasn't stood in front of their mirror and thought about their acceptance speech? Yeah, I think they yeah, all do. I, I think it's one of those things, once you get in the moment, it's hard to bring back those thoughts, basically. You know, you just get so thrown off. I would, I would have that thing so memorized, like... I don't know. I would be so nervous about even being up for an award that I would be like over preparing for and then I probably wouldn't get it and then but I would be I, oh goodness it would be I'm, I think I'm having anxiety just thinking about it not literally because I don't <laughs> have anxiety but like proverbial like starting to be like goodness that's a lot of work well the good thing about those award shows now you know there's like 30 of them and basically all the movies get nominated for the same thing so basically you have your chance to practice your speech about 20 or 30 times before you get to the Oscars at this point. Yeah. You really just don't have to change it a little bit, you know. Nice. Whatever. All right, gentlemen, I should probably go wash up and hit the proverbial hay. Mm. Same with me. So. It's a pleasure. Well, Can I get to work tomorrow, Red? Or today? Um, no, today is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. Good. Because uh, it's today, like I was, I was supposed to go to a, a conference, but it's raining quite heavily outside, and someone stole my umbrella. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not really on board with that idea anymore. I can go tomorrow. It's a two-day conference. How did you get your umbrella stolen in the safest, largest city you've ever okay, been? Okay, so right. Okay, here's the paradox. Here's the paradox. So it's the safest city in the world, the busiest city in the world, but um, cheap bikes and umbrellas are basically considered public property. <laughs> huh. So I went to 7-Eleven during a typhoon, which, you know, granted, you could tell me I'm an idiot just for that. And um, they have umbrella racks outside, so you don't wet the floor when you come into the store. So I left my umbrella in the rack. Went into the store, bought a sandwich, and because it was raining so heavily, I thought, hey, I'm going to eat my sandwich inside. So I sat at a table. And then as I left, I looked in the rack for my umbrella, and it was gone. So someone, during this maybe 10 minutes, decided, hey, I need an umbrella. That one's there. Took it and went. I think in the Christmas gift exchange, you are getting a bike lock for your umbrella. <laughs> Is that a thing? Is that is that actually a thing? <laughs> I think it's going to be. It is now, and we'll sell it on Think Geek. We'll sell oh, it yeah. to the Apple Bobbies. Or you could get one of those hats <laughs> that has an umbrella on top of it. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> like I didn't really get picked on as a nerd in school, but I really don't want to be picked on as a nerd just walking around the street. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Well, I think this is uh, probably a good point to stop. If 
if anybody actually makes it this point on the YouTube video, just comment that you made it to the two hour mark and we'll you you deserve some sort of prize or something. So Oh yeah, yeah. We still have comment. time to we'll private message you to get your address and we'll send you some Apple Bobbies. <laughs> yeah. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um well thanks if you have watched this point. Thanks for watching and um I guess we'll we'll wrap it up now. So um, see y'all next time. Yes, and Danny, we'll see you on Monday. Mm -hmm. Bye.